Good afternoon, everybody. My name is D.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're delighted to be here today with Adrienne Marie Brown celebrating her brand new novel, Hot Off the Press, Grievers. We are here as well with one of our favorites, Giese Lehman, to discuss this important book. So um, I just want to very quickly introduce you to Giese. If somehow you have not encountered Giese's work, Giese is a Black Southern writer from Jackson, Mississippi. He is the mm -hmm. author of the genre bending novel Long Division and the essay collection. Election, how to slowly kill yourself and others in America. He is also the essay, the the author of the best-selling memoir, Heavy, an American memoir. So, welcome, Kiesi. We're glad you're here. Thank you, and we are <laughs> delighted to be here with you, Adrian Marie Brown. Adrian is a writer, a student of the works of Octavia E. Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin. Grievers is her first novel, but her previous books include Octavia's Brood, Emergent Strategy, Pleasure Activism, We Will Not Cancel Us, and Holding Change. Her visionary fiction has appeared in the Funambulist, Harvard Design Review, and Dark Mountain. And I'll just say, Adrian, you hold, actually, the two of y'all basically hold more, more bestseller. I know it's not all about sales because we're all trying to tear down capitalism, but <laughs> y'all hold more slots in the Karis top 10 than any other duo probably of, of artists ever. So wow. this is like a best hits parade right here. That's um, awesome. So that's such a, that's a very special thing. Um, and so for all of y'all who are watching at home, just know this is, this is super exciting. We're very, very delighted to be celebrating this book, especially at this time. Grievers is a really urgent book. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's right on time as all of your work is, you know, your, your, your work is, is prescient and of the moment, which I think, um, anybody who reads it for the first time will feel very seen in it. Um, so folks, we want to let you know, you can ask questions at any point in case it will bring them into the conversation. You just click on that, ask a question button at the bottom center of the screen. And if you're on your phone and having trouble, you can put your question in the chat and I'll move it over. All right. So I'm going to get out of the way. Thank you all so much for being here and congratulations. <laughs> oh, oh, I love ER. I love Karis. I love yes. you. Before you wrote this book, uh, I found new ways to love. Um, I want to say something to folks listening before. We keep going. Okay. An hour is not enough for me to talk to you publicly for the first time. I, I, so I feel the same way. I was like, oh my God. I want to talk to you about so much of your other work that I can see like the residue of in here. So I'm going to we're gonna figure out ways to do that. And I also want to talk about the ending of this book, which we're not supposed to do yet because people haven't read it yet. But let me just tell y'all something. Y'all need to read Grievers. And I want to talk about the ending um, really badly with someone. Uh, so so we might get we might talk about the ending today. I mean, I think I'm, I think I can figure out some artful ways to talk about it. But <laughs> like, you 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 do something at the end of this book that I haven't seen done much at all. And, and I want I want to build to that. But anyway, first of all, I just want to thank you for writing this book and giving it giving us space and wanting to talk to me. So thank you. Thank you so much for reading this book and thank you for being who you are. Like I I I really am an open fan girl of you as a human being and the risks that you take as a writer and I was saying this before but I think everyone should know this is not my my one of my dear friends was like you need to talk to KSA about this book publicly and I was like no way no. and then I was like wait why not like let's let, let's yeah. just this way so but I'm my I can feel like everything in me is like pulsing like oh my gosh you really you really asked um, one of your very favorite writers to read your first oh, thing. so I'm and, nervous and, but I'm and, and excited and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say some, I'm gonna say some stuff too you know because I mean I my mama raised a, a little boy who loves to read I, I love yeah. to read and, yes. and and like you I get a lot of things online right like people yeah. be like do you want the hard copy I'd be like oh just send it to me I'll read it on yeah. I'll read it on the computer family. There's something about the weight of this book and the shape of this book. And mm -hmm. so, before, and, and I want to talk about the size of the book. And ER yeah. described it as a novel. Yeah. I've heard you talk about it as a novella. Novella, yeah. A novella. And, and so can we just talk about the distinction you make between novel and novella? And, and if you two felt like, like 
the weight of this book just felt right to you when you felt it in your hand for the first time? It does feel really right to me. I mean, one thing I had to shout out AK Press, my publisher, because every book I've done with them is like my favorite thing. The way it feels, mm -hmm. they, they always create something that I'm like, oh, that feels just right. And with this book, I started working on the story, the first story of it in like 2011, and then it expanded out into an, a novel. And then when Black Dawn was getting started, they were like, uh, do you have anything that could work as short, a short, you know, like a novella, right? And I was like, eh. I sent them this and I was like, you can cut it down, right? Yeah. We can cut it into a novella. Yeah. And, uh, and Sunina Clark got back to me and was like, oh no, this is novella trilogy. And you have the first two sections and then I think I can see what the third one could be. And I was like, oh, exactly. I was like, is that yeah. what you just said? Yes. And so when I when I opened it up and I held it, there's something that feels like right now, this feels like such a readable offer. Like I'm like, right. That's it's, it. a, it's a lot of feelings, but it's it's you can sit in an afternoon and read it, you know? But um, like a lot of what you do. It's real sneaky, fam. Like it's, it's it's sneaky in the best way in that the weightedness of it made me feel not just calm, but like invited in. Mm -hmm. And then you do, a, I mean, the, the, the writing is lush. I want to talk about why you chose the third person. We got to talk about the name Dune. We got to talk about that. We want, I, I, I mean, I also just want to talk to you specifically before we start about the necessity of what people traditionally call politics entering a book like this right yeah. like because we've read uh, lots of us have read quote unquote dystopian books utopian books um heterotopia you know so i think heterotopia is actually what this book is doing i would argue but 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 we rarely see the authors so explicitly say and show that they are writing to and through politics through the art of lush artfulness but can we talk about the, the usefulness of you of politics and art? And do you even see them as a schism? Like, do you see politics over here, art over here? Or do you see them all collectively? Reading this book, it feels like you see them all sort of occupying the same pulp. And then as a writer, you bring yeah. us into the pulpiness. But I just want to see if that is Yeah, I mean, this is like, you, you're on to me. You know, I, I do think that the personal is political, art is political, everything is political. And... I think the idea that something can't be political is a sign mm. of privilege, right? Mm. So it's like, oh, like this isn't political. It's like, no, then you're just upholding the status quo. And it's probably deeply imbued in, in a politic, even if it's a politic of normalizing, you know, um, normalizing violence, normalizing patriarchy, yeah. normalizing boringness, you know, like suburb, suburban layout is a political act, right? It, even though it just looks like a bunch of little houses. So I feel like that, and for me, Politics is where I've spent my life. My adult right. life has been a political act, one political act after another, and one political awakening after another. So, you know, the book, like when it was time to start writing this, what what I wanted to write about was how grief and grief denied is a political mm. thing, yeah. and who gets denied the room to grieve, um, and what that does to the body, what that does to the spirit, what that does to a community. Um, to me, that that feels like one of the biggest things I see as a political worker is that I'm like, oh, we don't have any time to grieve right. before the next challenge comes. And what would it look like to do that? So, yeah, the politics is in there. And I wanted to pay homage. There's like people who folks need to know about. And if they can't know them, you know, they may never go and read Grace Lee Boggs' autobiography. Yes. They might not see that that's a text they need to engage with. So I'm like, OK, but you still need to meet Grace. You need to be touched by the energy of grace. So, and and one of the one of the decisions, you know, I I read as a writer for better or worse. Yes. Um, and often, I mean, yeah, often is worse because even when we're reading this book, I I just wanted to write after every you know twenty pages. I wanted to go and write, but you start like the, this book starts with epigraph from from Grace from, from Grace Lee Boggs, right? One. Yes. yes. I always think that it's sort of like. I don't try to tell people that they need to pick one epigraph, but I, I often believe more, I trust more often in the author's um, discretion if they if they find one and mm -hmm. let that one carry the day. But the mm -hmm. one that you chose, is it's a doozy, fam. But I wonder if you thought, 
Should it be this one? I know it's going to be Grace Lee Boggs. Should it be like, how did you come up with the epigraph? <laughs> yeah, like, I was really, um, you know, there's this other quote of hers, transform yourself to transform the world that I live inside of that quote. And so for a long time, I thought that that was what it was. And then this one kept coming back around and coming back around and just being like, no, we're beginning to understand that we have souls. <laughs> like it's actually, it, it's also like not just for this novella, but for the whole arc of the yeah. storyline, this is the epigraph that is like, that nourishes the whole thing, you know? Yeah. Well, it's like, um, and I also, I hope it's a little bit of a hope because I was like, we're, we're, I'm <laughs> dunking your head in the water right away. <laughs> right? Right. We're going straight in. So it was also a little bit like, this is all part of the soul growth yeah. journey, right? Yeah. Grief is a part of how we grow. So yeah, and and the mm -hmm. and the epigraph is we are beginning to understand that we have souls. Yes. Um, and again, you know, folks who do what people traditionally consider the most soulful writing often don't get lauded for the particularity of the art. And and there's mm -hmm. some sentences in here, fam, um, and some scenes. Like there's that scene where you start to describe where Dune is describing where the churches once were, like you talk about the steeples and then like the churches once were there or something like that. Um, yes. That's just, that's just, that's just, I mean, it's beautiful. It's, it's packed with politics, but it's attentive to doing sensibility in a way that we might not expect one who is doing like overt soul writing to do. Right. And so yeah. I'm interested in like the particularities of Dune. How did you not know what Dune was going to do, but how did you, Talk to me about when you understood the particularities of what Dune sees, feel, touches, and smells. I want to talk about that before we talk about the journey yeah. that Dune goes on. Uh, I like this question. So I feel like from, from almost the moment that I first landed in Detroit, this was the experience I had of like what it meant to be a real Detroiter. Mm. Like every time I've spent time with like a born and raised Detroiter, they were like, there's a city on this city and it's wow. in my head. And it's it's beautiful and lush and like everything happened there. We had churches, we had bars, we had this whole block was there was a house on every single lot that you see and everything you see that's green that was someone's home that you know <laughs> everyone was everyone walks around with that and I think that's one of the marks of a Detroiter is you're walking around with multiple eras of the city just in your head and you see it and the longer I lived there the more I had that same experience where so I was like oh. Just because they take a building away doesn't mean it goes anywhere in your head. Like it's still there. And maybe a longing is still there. Like even on a small level, there's this restaurant called Goodwell's, this little community diner spot that was there for years and it had the best sandwich of all time. Like I'm not, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like vegan things. I'm always like, why is this a fake version of something I like? Right. But they had the best vegan sandwich. And when it was gone, like if I drive down the road, Willis, that was on, I'm like looking for Goodwells, my heart is, right? And I'm like, we have the cities and the cities and the cities. And I'd seen other people uh, write about this in ways that I thought were really beautiful. But I, I was like, I, I feel like I haven't seen someone who's just explicitly talking about like mm -hmm. seeing those layers. And mm -hmm. I also wanted it, as I started writing Dune's father, I was like, you know, what's the part of her father that's carrying through into her? And he's a cartographer. He's like a map maker. He's a, a analyst. He's an archivist, you know, so that then I was also like, okay, how can I bring that forward in, in her, even if initially she doesn't see herself that way. Right. And, and one of the things you do again, you know, it's tough reading the novella slash fiction of someone who has taught so many of us like how to know, how to feel, but also like, and I don't want to put this on you, but you know, I think you teach a number of us like how to be, right? Yeah. And, and in some ways, I don't think we expect people who teach us how to know, feel, and be to, to, to accept mystery. Uh -huh. But this book is is engined, fam, by mystery, and that and you don't do the easy thing, which is, and I'm not and I'm not telling you too much when I say this, but but the ending is is to <laughs> me unexpected. But but you don't do what I think I would have done or some other writers would have done, which is like not trust myself and try to like tie it all up in a bow. Like you still seem to be okay 
hanging on some mystery. I think that is a feat for any writer, but particularly a writer who is tasked with so many of us looking to you for answers. And I'm so I want to know how you feel, how and if you feel okay being lost in the mystery of fiction, which is what fiction often is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the answer to this is like when I was little, like when I was first writing, the first thing I was ever writing were stories, like fiction stories. Like, you know, I was like, I hear the voices, there's a lot happening here. And that's a through line. So even as I was over here writing my nonfiction work, it was always like, but I'm going to get like fiction is what I'm supposed to really be doing. Like, that's what I really want to do. And part of it is because the mysterious is allowed there and encouraged there. And, um, and, and in a way, the idea is like your readers going to come forward and they're going to dance with it, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, like they're going to, they're going to, you know, I know people are going to read this who've never been to Detroit, but they've loved someplace and they're going to fill in with some places of their own. They're going to fill in some of the emotional content with their own losses and stuff like that. Right. Um, so there's that piece. But also I've always wanted to have the feeling of uh, this piece where I'm like, oh, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> so there's a part of it, right, that I'm like, just you wait. Like, you know, I'm really excited for people. I have, you know, folks who are reaching out to me like, um, I really love Dune and, and I'm really rooting for Dune and I'm really like, like what's going to happen with fucking Dune, you know? And I'm like, just you wait. It's like so great. Um, and worth the wait, hopefully, you know, yeah. like, yeah. because I feel like that in my own life, I'm like, the best things that have happened to me, I didn't know they were coming. Like there were hints and clues and mysterious unveilings. But I was like, I didn't know. I didn't know. Right. Most of what, like, if I'm 43, I'm like, most of what my days look like right now is like, I didn't know this was possible. Right. It's fantastic. I had to crawl through the mud, you know, to get here. And writing this book is a lot of like Dune in the mud, you know. Yeah. But, uh, and then there's big mysteries, right? There's mysteries that can be resolved in the story, and there's mysteries that are beyond that. And uh, so I try to do, do right by the ones that are, that are, can be put on paper. And 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 you create in Dune a character who can hold not just our like you know, people often talk about contradictions, but but you know Dune can hold like the, the soulful proclamations. Like this isn't a character necessarily that we're I mean we're wondering, but we also know that Dune believes and thinks and feels particular things that you know you know. But because Dune accepts so much and pushes back against so much else i just started to wonder about the difference between love and acceptance and the creation of dune the creation of this literary detroit and the creation of dune's father so i'm wondering like for you as the architect creator channeler however we want to talk about it like do you do you love dune love this detroit and love Dune's father and or do you just simply accept them? Mm -hmm. I think that I accept the Detroit, like to me, a big part of this book is my own grief for Detroit as yeah. a city of change. Yeah. And, you know, really wanting to like grasp on to the, the, the Detroit that I got to be a part of for over a decade, right? That I'm like, it was the best. It was right. the best. Like it was the fucking best. And that's what everyone needs to know. So there's a part of me that's like, I, I love that Detroit and I'm accepting that God has changed and that cities change. Cities, being in a city is being in a place that is constantly changing. And some of that is driven by capitalism. Like it's like, right. you don't get to exist if you're not making a new highway and creating these new developments. And um, so there is some acceptance of the place as a place of change. Dune, I love all the characters, you know, all the characters are imprinted by ghosts of my own, right? So they're people that I loved and that I am grieving. And so there's a way that I'm like, I love the person who inspired or imprinted into the character. Um, I think I've been really surprised by how much they then became their own mm. people. Mm -hmm. And I got surprised, like Dune really surprised me. There were choices that I, I, I would sort of like be like, we're going this way and Dune would right. be like, I'm not ready wow. for that yet, actually. Ooh. I'm not ready to, you know, like if it was me, Dune would have like reached out to the community of people who were 
who are reaching out to her and, and grieve with others. And she was like, no. And in that, it gave me a permission. I was like, I've never given myself mm. permission to just turn off the phone, close the door and grieve yeah. the way I really wanted to. Um, so I feel some jealousy of, of Dune. Um, mm -hmm. And her father and her mother, I do love them. <laughs> you know, I really do love them. They're flawed individuals, but I think that they, you can tell that they really loved each other mm -hmm. and that they really like, they love Dune. They let her be different from them, which I think is really hard for parents. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things you do in this book is, you know, as, as this might be too much in the weeds, but sometimes, <laughs> as, a, sometimes as a writer, like, um, if I'm describing just a crowd of people, and I'm yeah. not going to give any other people name. I'm not really going to give them any, I'm not going to describe any faces. Like sometimes when I was first start, starting to write, like I felt so much for every single person in that <laughs> crowd. I didn't yeah. want to describe that crowd lovelessly. Yes. And I saw the same shit going on in here, fam. Like yes. th there's a passage here where you say, this is, this is, this is not necessarily like, like we're not necessarily in scene. We're not necessarily talking about people who get to uh, come alive spectacularly. But listen to the love of that you that you give the, just this just this little crowd. There were no allies, no advocates. Each civilian there was on the front line, had witnessed the sickness, been untrained hospice, and sometimes grave digger for their loved ones. They wanted answers. They needed to hear a compelling future. And the they is that group of people, right? There were no allies, mm -hmm. there were no advocates, but the they is also Detroit, right? Like the they often in this book is Detroit. And often when writers use they, you, you usually get like clumsy blah, blah, blah language following a they because it's a they, there's no singularity to it. Yes. But I wonder if you can talk about the beauty and the complication of the they. Because I want to talk mm -hmm. about I want to talk about doing in a second, but what you do is you 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 give life and activity to like homogenous blobs and in doing that they become non-homogenous blobs anymore <laughs> i wonder if you yeah, I mean, detroiters are very distinct you know and i think it's also detroit is rooted in in blackness which is so distinct and i feel like there's the one of the things that thrills me and maybe detroit taught me this um i feel like when i moved to detroit there were still some vestiges of like there's a monolithic blackness and mm -hmm. there's something about a black city that, you know, I'm going to move. This is my, that was my first time living in a city. I was like, this is a black city, right? Wow. Like I grew up half, half time in Germany, right? I went to uh, Colombia. Like it was just like, I was never in a slave. <laughs> like, we are the majority. Right, right, right. And then getting to Detroit, I feel like I was able to experience our non-monolithic, like the beauty of all the distinct ways of blackness. And then the commonality of all of us are not, being given the power over this place that we love and that we've stayed in, you know? Yeah. So especially the first years of my organizing in Detroit, what, was, what moved me so much was there's people who were like, we could have left, everyone else left. A lot of people left, the jobs left, the money left, but we stayed here. And so we are owed a, a part, a role in shaping the future of this place. Mm -hmm. And I've been in that room so many times, I know what it smells like. And I know that there are people in there who are like, let's be diplomatic about this. And there are people who are like, fuck that, it's time to fight. And that tension is constantly, it doesn't go anywhere. That tension is never resolved. That's the reform revolution. That's the tension of what it means to be, I think, Black in America and paying right. attention, right? right. And so I feel like I wanted, I wanted people to come into those rooms and I want them to feel um, invitational. Like, I'm like, in your city, there are rooms like that right now. You know, yes. like I do want people as they're reading this to to kind of feel that fire of like, why care? And then why act from that care? Yeah. And coming to those rooms and being like, there are always rooms full of people fighting for you. Always. You're never unfought yes. for. Yes. You're never unloved. Right. Even if you don't agree with the politic, you are never unloved. Right. Right. So right. I wanted people to feel that. Like what what is in the organizer heart? You know? Yeah, that's a that's a superpower. I think that we don't call a superpower um, enough. You know, I grew up in Jackson, which is a very different city than Detroit, but, you know, like Jackson, you know, became <laughs> Chicago, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. parts of Alabama became Detroit. Exactly. Um, 
We call it up south for a reason. Yeah, you know? definitely, definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm. You know, I, I wanted to wait sort of toward the end of the conversation to talk about <laughs> Dune's mother a bit more because that's the shit that blew my mind most in this book. I think in terms of character. Um, mm-hmm. But I also want to encourage y'all to please put your questions in the ask question, um, <laughs> and we'll weave them in um, as, as organically as possible. But but Dune's mother, right, is 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 sort of like the patient for for people who haven't read it for this illness. Yes. And it, do you do would you call it an illness? I don't even know if you would call it an illness. We call it a syndrome, like a syndrome. it's mysterious okay. illness syndrome. Yeah, yeah, but there's just like something's happening to the bodies. And 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 one of the things, and 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 she's patient one. She's you know patient zero. And and one of the things that this syndrome does is, is it literally stops you mid whatever yeah okay can we can you you can say no to this i asked you before there's some things you don't want to talk about but like mm-hmm. can you talk to me about like the premise fam like how'd you even and did you get the premise before you got the character of dune's mother yeah i did so the premise came the very first couple of losses that happened while i was living there i noticed that what happened in the community was the community would pause and it would feel like we all wanted to stop, but didn't know how, right? Mm-hmm. But it was like, you know, David Blair is dead. Like this person's yeah. dead. Like, and there's, and I think we all know that feeling where it's like, now we should all stop, right? And and we should do some kind of ritual and honoring and sit shiver for seven days or something. Mm-hmm. Like we should do something that is as the size of this person. And we kept not doing that. It was like, no one quite knew what to do. And then we'd be like, is there a memorial? And I don't know. And it it just gets rushed over. And it's like, I don't think it goes anywhere. You know, I think that energy is just sitting there. So the premise came first. It's like, what what if grief just actually did stop us? Like, and and what if it was specifically for for the black city of Detroit, you know, as the emergency management crisis played out and and this idea that like, y'all wanna just take this too? It's too much. And so there's also that like, what if what happens when our grief is too much as black people to bear and right. we've tried the method of coming straight out of slavery into total barely surviving jim crow barely surviving and now we're being shot in the streets and locked up and we there's been no moment to just be like no what if we just had to stop so that premise was there and then my friend charity hicks was killed hit by a bus in New York City. Um, And and she is imprinting on both the mom and the best friend, Eloise. It's like, because she's that big. (laughs) She was like so big. But Charity was that kind of person who she filled a room. Yeah. The idea of her being stopped instantly by a bus. And then she lived for another month. And I got to visit her uh, and just see what had been so there, so absent. And I was like, it's still hard to put, you know, into words other than the words I got onto that page. But I was like, I need to capture that feeling of having seen someone so there and then not there and but not dead. You know, like I wanted to really tease out the distinctions because I also think I see this happening in the city and I see this happening amongst our people is there's a lot of us who go on without our life force. And I think a lot of us, we go through the motions, right? We can maybe seem like we're breathing, but the breath is shallow. We can't cry. We can't connect. We're lonely, whatever it is. It shows up in a million ways, but there's ways that we are living alive, but not. And so that I wanted, I wanted to really sit in that place um, and call it, call it out, call it in. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm like, there's something profound happening. And I also, you know, since you and I, you know, like, I, I know you know this, in the world right now, I think so much of our rage at each other is in that place. You know, it's like, I can right. see that you're not fully living in into what you could do. And you're angry about that. And I, you know, some of that's like, I can't reach what I want to reach. I'm going to tear you down. Yes. Right? And so I wanted to, I was like, okay, how do we pull all these different threads of what, what is happening to black people right now? Um, and, and how many of us are gone before it's our time, yeah. whether we're gone, gone, 
or just empty. Right, right. And, and you know, I feel like if I ask this question wrong, I'm asking you to give the book away. Like, <laughs> but, but so I want to ask it the right way. Um, like folks who get the syndrome do not recover. Yeah, so far. So far, right, right. So far, so far right. yeah. So, and, and yet the book is saying so much about recovery and repair. Yes. So I wonder if you can talk about like the decision to make this syndrome be something you do not recover, you do not recover from. Yes. But, and what is, what, what is the, but without giving the book away? Yeah. I mean, I think this doesn't give the book away. I think, um, I, I hope this doesn't give the book away, but I really think that, that, and maybe I'll speak about this as, as like in the American experiment yes. conversation is we're dying in this country. Right. We're dying. We're not loved. We're not uplifted. We're not protected. We know that this country is not loving us, but we stay. And we stay because we're like, this is aliveness. This is the center of the world. This is the superpower. This is, the, I can't even imagine going someplace else. And, you know, this, we have to be here. And I think that assumption causes us much damage, right? Right, Because we stay, even though I'm like, this is an abusive relationship, yeah. you know? So I think there's some of that in here that it's like, the assumption is that staying is the most important thing. But if you're not being treated well and you're overwhelmed with grief, is staying the most important thing? And I feel like what Doom is starting to notice, is starting to lean into for herself is, what would make it compelling to stay? Right. And yeah. in that, you know, I'm a scholar of Octavia, and I feel like that's the thing that Octavia is always asking us is how do we make it compelling to stay, to keep being alive, to keep being a human, to keep trying? And I writing this book was me being like, okay, let's let's figure it out. Let's go yeah. with, with one person who right. has every reason to want to leave. You know, that kind of grief makes you really not sure you want to stay. But there's still something that's like, well. I should go harvest from this garden. You know, yeah. I'm like, okay, what is that? What is that that small impulse to to prepare for the winter? Right. You know, um, and I I do believe that Dune. She's she's finding a way. Right. <laughs> you know, she's finding right. a way, and her her allies are not human. You know, there's yeah. there's spirit, there's dogs, there's all kinds of stuff happening, but she's figuring it out. And and I th I think one of the most like. Um sort of provocative moves you make is you create this world that one would understandably need to wander away from to find and feel oneself. But you show us how wandering in a city built upon a city is necessarily an escape in itself and a running to home, right? Yes. Simultaneously. Yeah. Um, and you and you do it so well, and 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 this is where this is where I started to think about like the 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 point of view you chose, um, you know when when I read characters that are so are as particular and sort of like I, I often call talking to my students about like defamiliarizing your your, your characters like and yeah. Dune is Dune is a, a familiar soul with like like unfamiliar kind of particularities that I love. But what made you write it in a third, a close third, as opposed to like a a, a, a hardcore first from yeah. Dune POV with Dune writing out to the world? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it was I started it from a different perspective. Like when I started writing this story, I was writing from Kama's perspective, the mother's oh, perspective. Wow. And I was really in it. <laughs> I was like really deeply in it. And then I was like, wait a second. I think if I'm going to... I think the only perspective I'll be able to see through the way I need to see through this is actually Dune's perspective. Mm -hmm. And then Dune intimidated me, you know, Dune intimidated me. Like she's so self-possessed and there's mystery for me with her, you know, like I, I can't pretend that I'm like, I know her in and out. She's much more introverted. She's, her gender is different than I have lived inside of. There's parts of her that I'm like, in some way, the best I can do is be a close observer to her. <laughs> you know, that felt I true do. for me. Yeah. That felt how to respect her as a character. So I'm 
I'm now in the process of writing the second novella. And it's interesting because I'm like, oh, you know, do I want to give myself some spaces where I, do, I go into first with her and how would I do that? What would that look like? Because um, we are closer now. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. yeah, you know, it was, that that was what led to that choice was being like, well, let me write it from here and see how close she'll let me get. Love and it. you see how it is in the book. Like she's, if you try to come in her door, she's like, she nah, she ain't answering come in this door. Like, no, I feel like that's really how she, is. she look out the blinds at your ass and then be like, I ain't here. You she know what like, I mean? I like, just remembered I don't like you. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> I love that. And, 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 and I love the way you articulated earlier, like, you know, like the, the fic, the expect the experience, one of the experiences of creating fiction is when you actually do see these characters slash people slash spirits, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. And you're like, all right, come on, we walking this way. And yes. they're like, no, 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 no. We're not walking that way, fam. We're going this way. And That's often right. I think you can tell books that that in in spite of the character slash spirit walking away, the writers are still sort of like memetically like going forward as if the character <laughs> is with them. And then yes. motherfuckers have no soul. I mean, those books just have, they, they're, they're soulless, fam, to me. Um, yeah. but, but, but you were able to do the opposite of that. So effectively here, I want to get this, 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 cause I didn't want to talk about dreams, um, dream sequences. They're so perfectly the realm of dream time and the tangle of real life that is transported to another dimension in your storytelling and the way the waking dream and start to really mm-hmm. tangle and the magic and the diorama. Okay. So that's not necessarily a question, but a comment. Do you, do you want to speak <laughs> about, about, hey. about the dream sequence? I didn't want to talk about dreams. So you want to talk about the dream sequences a bit? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I I'm a I'm like a heavy dreamer. Like I dream a lot. I get a lot of clarity in my dreams. I wake up and I'm like, oh damn, I didn't know I knew that. Now I knew that. You know, like I dream actively. And uh for Dune, I needed a way for her to still be in touch with the others, the people, you know, that she loved. And I know from my own experience that that's where people show up for me, right? It's like, um, I love this person. I miss it. Not just show up, but show up honestly. Right. Yeah. So there, there's something where you're like, oh, I broke up with that person, but I'm having a dream about having sex right. with them. What right. is it? We're, I'm over that person. Okay. But my subconscious is, you know, has some stuff to work through. So I wanted that. And I also wanted there to be some communication, some, some messages to her that were coming through the dream sequences. And it was important to me that she not wake up remembering them necessarily, but just have yeah. the like an emotional, you know, like a sense of like, what was that? Like the dream sequence where where it starts out with like Marta on the table and she like wakes up from that and she feels aroused, but she can't quite remember why. I was like, I love, I for me, I'm like, I love that kind of, you know, I was like, I wanna write something like that where it's like, yeah. the you know, and again, this is why not doing the first person was helpful for me. It was like, I get to be omnipotent enough to see that <laughs> and see the dream and see how she wakes up um, like not content, you know, um, in her body. And I'm like, yeah, the dream space and the dream space. I also strongly believe that dreams are there. Like, I think that dream realm is a place. And I think that that shows in this, the dream, there's another Detroit happening in the dream realm here. Yeah. And we get to visit like the the dream realm of the river walk and stuff like that. Um, I like the idea that there's, several Detroit's happening. And and slippage, you know, like like slippage is something I feel like that um carries this one of the things that carries this book, not just like the slipping away, which I want to talk about of people and body and mem of po- possibly memory, but 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 the slippages, right? Like like as 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 welcoming and well sometimes welcoming, but as interesting as Dune is, like Again, like there's a slippage, right? When you think Dune is that cuddly, blah blah blah, like there's gonna be a slippage, right? When you think you know, you know yeah. what, like the way Detroit is going to be personified, not characterized, but personified, like you know, there, there's a slippage. But I want to read this this sentence in here that that you know, there are also these sentences in this book that will read your ass and and make you feel something that you might not want to feel. One of the sentences is, "How many people were dying like this, mm-hmm. quietly slipping away in their own homes?" Ooh, I wanna I wanna read that sentence, man. Um because we are a lot more than that, but we are that. Yeah. 
and 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 this this is this is this is not a fair question but but you're adrian marie brown but like what do we do with the slipping away that happens in our own home like if we can slip away and the characters here can slip away and detroit can slip away in its own home yeah what and where yes well you know community is always the answer right community is always 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 the answer that's organizer heart creed and part of what's happening part of what this is also really informed by the COVID experience right yeah. like part of what is happening is the the way you die is shaped by the community that you have so for some people it's like okay I'm dying in a hospital by myself, but I still have community. They're like, these nurses are gonna put me on FaceTime and I'm gonna fucking be there, yeah. right? Yeah. They're gonna hear my fucking voice, right? Something, but there's people who don't have that. And that to me is the biggest critique of, of what a capitalist society produces at the end. Cause it's like all the stuff, the profit that it's horrible, but at the, at the root of it is like, we're meant to be born into other people's hands and we're meant to die being held in our beloved's hands. That's that. I, I know this is true. I've seen people die that way. I know that's the way we're supposed to be surrounded by those who have loved us in our life. Those who we've influenced, those who we've touched, they're supposed to be able to hold our hands and watch right. us go and wash us afterwards and clean us afterwards. And it's supposed to still be a beloved, sacred, intimate act. And if that's not possible, then there's a whole break, like the society is actually not functional. Mm -hmm. right? um, and that felt important to me that that I also knew that, you know, one of the characters who well, um, we haven't even seen yet. Oh, I, I guess I shouldn't even talk about it. Anyway, one of the characters that comes in later is someone who I know died alone and when when those of us who love this person found out they had died alone, that was the most devastating thing. And yeah. I know I know you know what I mean, and I know anyone who's watching this knows you know that that idea of what were their last moments? Did they know? Yeah, all of that is just it's too much. It's too much to too hold much. alone. And even in trying to grieve it, we can't grieve it alone. You know, yeah. part of writing this book is like. Of coming out as a griever, <laughs> you know, just being like, yeah, y'all look at me as like she's got answers and love, but I'm like, I am also a walking grief, and um, and our generation is holding more known grief than than previous generations, right? So, yeah. I think in the past, it's like, oh, you know, my circle is impacted by grief, but you even like we look back at slavery and we're like, oh, I can see everything that was happening there, but. The experience, the lived experience was like, I just know that my immediate world is a shit show. It's right. horrific. Right. And it's dying here. But now we know, like, on a global level, here's what's happening to us. Here's the specifics yeah. of it. Here's the numbers. Here's the data. And trying to carry all of that is is overwhelming. And I think paying attention, becoming death doulas, becoming competent at being able to be present with each other's mortality, you know, is a part of what communities need to get. Right. Like, and, and, and I wonder what happens. I mean, people often talk about this when we're talking about, you know, extrajudicial killings of black folk. Um, but I but I do wonder what what ha I, I want to figure out. I, I want to try to say this in a way that doesn't. Yeah, I, I, I wonder what happens when like, you know, in 86 or whatever, when I were or maybe what I don't remember what year it was, but I was like in fifth or sixth, seventh grade and the Challenger blew up. Right. Uh -huh. We're all watching it. We're looking at this yes. thing go up. We're, yes. in, we're in school. And school wasn't, you know, even at that age, school wasn't safe to a number of us. It was fun because we had right. community. Right. But we it was the first time we watched people in real life explode. Right. Right. And and then I remember, you know, a few years later, we watched Rodney King yes. get destroyed. Right. Yes. And and so like I, I wonder about this notion of or this idea of of grief and creative grieving, with the inundation not just of images, but the inundation of of actual reverberations, yeah, of people who refuse to grieve always like in our face, right? Boom, boom, boom. Yes. Like how do you grieve when you got to go to the next? You got to go to the next. You got to go to the next. That's right. Um. And I just feel like this book in some way is a rumination on the possibilities of creative grief and the consequences 
of of grief. Um, but I guess what I'm under, wondering from your point of view is like how much of this has to do with innovation technology as black folk who were brought to this country as technology and mm -hmm. innovation. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that last piece is like, that's the essence of it in a way right. that's like, we weren't designed, you know, black in America was not designed to feel right. at all, right? right? It's like, who who are you to have feelings? Who are you to fall in love? Who are yeah. you to, to develop parental connection? Who are you to grieve? Like, you're a machine, right. you're a tool, you know? And because that hasn't changed in so many minds, right? Because I think that's the piece is there's this idea of like, oh, a war was won and we had a black president. It's like, but but what we can clearly see by our electoral processes, what we can clearly see by the the decision making that happens. I mean, <laughs> we're in the South, we're we're going through it. What we can clearly see is that was never cleared, that that sense of there's no room to feel if you're not as black oppressed, you know? No doubt. No doubt. Um, and so I think that, I think it's a radical thing to reclaim your feeling. I think mm -hmm. it's a radical thing to um, also reclaim ritual. So yeah. a lot of what Dune is up to, even though she wouldn't name it this way, uh, but a lot of what she's up to is learning the, the ritual arts, right? Um, that come naturally. And this is something I wanna name that in their work I've done through Emergent Strategy, we did these gatherings and we did like 10, 12 of these gatherings. And in each one, we would ask people like, what do you wanna talk about? This is your space, it's a political space. And in almost every single one, what came up was the need for grief ritual of some sort. Mm. And the groups themselves, these would, were 75 to 85 people in all, they would come up with these beautiful rituals of release and letting go and naming names and, I was like, oh, this is in us. It was not broken out of us. Like we, it was not colonized out of us. It has not been beaten out of us. There's no forgetting it. We need those rituals. And I think right now that becomes a new technology that we yeah. figure out, right? Is, you know, one of the only reasons I'm interested in the, the network of the Wi-Fi, blah, 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 internet, social, whatever is I'm like, I'm really interested in the new rituals that are emerging. Right or not emerging around grief. So now we see, you know, like we can all say, it's like, oh, this person died. Our ritual is, let me find a picture of them that moves me. I'll post that picture with my story of how they influenced and changed me and how I appreciate them. And I'll post it because I want everyone to know I too grieve this person, yeah. right? And I'm like, does that satisfy that person's soul? Does it satisfy yeah. our souls? Does it satisfy something about belonging to a community that grieves together? Does it actually satisfy what the grief needs? Mm -hmm. Or do we need more? Hint, hint. I think we need a lot more. Right? more right. I think we need a lot more. And I, the other piece of this book uh, that I'm sitting with, it, it really made me have to shift my own practices around this is Dune is really not about performance. There's no performativity. She's just like, I don't, I don't care what anyone else thinks about this, right. right? And for the most part, I don't really care what anyone else thinks about me. Um, I love that about. That's like one of my favorite things about her. But that piece where I'm like, what does it look like to go through these processes if we're not performing them for someone else, mm -hmm. but actually experiencing them from within? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that for Black people, that's a lot of what we have to figure out in terms of culture. Period is how do we stop performing a culture to say our survival is is worthwhile look at how great we are at basketball and music and you know it's like we're performing this excellence all the time in our grief in our life for some observer to validate us yeah and yeah. there's something in me that's like what if we turn it inward <laughs> and stop performing things that become viral for other people and take care of ourselves um yeah. take care of all that emotionality so that interiority. And if, yeah. we, and if we think about language at, and our language as a as a kind of um, innovation or and or techno technology, if yeah. I'm not saying we should, but if we do, yeah. and you think about what we do as 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 storytellers, as as art makers, um, word art makers, as as sometimes like assembling the technology and creating things that people can find themselves in. So like emergent strategy is now something 
that people I know who don't even know your name talk about, right? Yes. But I wonder what, do, do we have the responsibility then as the creators of those assemblages of words to feel those words with new and or old feelings? And, and, or, and how do you do that in a capitalist system which tells you, I created emergent strategies, I created something called heavy, this is what it is, right? That's like, right. How, go ahead. That's right. I mean, so this is the thing that I feel like I think I'm very, I think this is where being an organizer and a writer is really, really helpful because as an organizer, it's like, none of this is yours. <laughs> There's no new ideas, right? right? right. We, right. Like at, every time I thought I was having some innovative new idea, yeah. I would go back and read something and be like, oh, Grace was talking about this like 30 years ago. You know, Milkar Cabral was an emergent strategist. Like these folks were, they, it's not that the ideas are new, but the level of freedom that I have to practice these ideas or to articulate these ideas, um, that is new, right? Mm -hmm. the, the capacity to actually build community in the open. You know, like I walk around on a regular basis and I'm like, I'm queer, I'm a witch, you know? I, I just say whatever the fuck I am right. that day yes. and, it's, and it's okay, right? And even in the organizing community, which still prickles a little bit when you change, even there, I change, we change and we accept it, we figure it out, We, you know? So that feels important because then coming to writing, I'm like, I know emergent strategy is not mine. You know, I know pleasure activism is not mine. I know that Audre Lorde was thinking about this. I know that that the bees are up to, you know, like literally, the, the, like I'm like, I'm just observing something that y'all are up to, right? right and right. I'm able to put it into words, but I don't write things I can't feel and that I haven't practiced. And that right. was the scariest part for moving into this fictional realm is I'm like, do you practice, you know, like what do you practice? Like, how do you practice living, you know, or being in all these experiences? And what I was able to draw on was like, oh, you are, you're always practicing something. I've mm -hmm. grieved many times, yes. you know, I've built altars. Um, I, I am, I love maps. I love listening to people tell stories. I love, you know, if someone tells me something was somewhere. I don't forget that. Right. And I'm like, oh, so the Motown building was there. Right. And when it got knocked down, Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder's, you know, sheet music was blowing down the street. I'm never going to forget that. That's a Detroit mm -hmm. story. That has to be in a Detroit book, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think, yeah, like for me, the just like what you did in Heavy, it's like what you did was you tapped into a vein that many of us can feel. Right. And because many of us feel it, we're grateful to you for tapping into it and allowing us to feel it, allowing us to talk about it together and to say, maybe I don't have to be ashamed that this vein also runs through me, right? And maybe I can step back and be like, oh, maybe shame is now a prison or a container right. that I am, I am subjugating myself inside of, but I don't have to. If I tell the story, can I liberate myself a little? And we all look to you and be like, did it liberate you to tell that story? Right. <laughs> you know, right. like, right. like that's what you know we're up to. It's like it, it doesn't have to be new, but it is personal. It is distinct. Yeah. It could only come through you, and I that does feel like a goal for me. Is I want to figure out like the ideas are the river. You know, I didn't create the river, right. but if I'm going to flow in the river, I am a distinct thing. I'm a distinct yeah. entity, right? Absolutely. So I'm the only one who will move down the river my way, yeah. and. Um, and people will like that way or not like that way. You know, yeah. re reading you over the years, I've I've been trying to. Um, <laughs> I've been, tr you know, because like your work and <laughs> and like the capitalist current run, sort of antithetical, right? And so like I've been trying, and and when you grow up having, you know, not grown up, you know, my mom and dad were 19 and 20 and at Jackson State, yes. they came from people who didn't have anything. I mean, who had lots and lots, but didn't have any money. Material, yeah. Material. So, like, I'm, I'm prone, though, to be like, I own blank, right? Like, I own heaven. Yeah. But what you have been yeah. encouraging me to say and feel is I helped make How to Slowly. I helped make heavy. I helped make whatever I might help make next. But I feel like that is not just a rhetorical exercise with you. It's not just like it's it's a way of life, right? You helped make and help be unmade by emergent mm -hmm. strategies, pleasure activism. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think my friend Adaku Uta, 
She founded something called Harriet's Apothecary. And she says, I partnered with Harriet Tubman to found this, right? Wow. And it's been around for, you know, like a decade, right? So we can understand what she means when she says that, that Harriet Tubman left enough artifacts of idea and practice and ways of being yes. that Ibaku could, you know, a century later look at that and be like, I know right. what you were up to and I'm up to that and we can go, right? Yes. Yeah. And I feel like that, like we're all partnering with things, some things we can name because some of the ancestors or some of the thinkers were able to put it on paper. You know, that's a that's a distinction. That's something that's relatively new for our folks to to say, oh, there was enough of mm-hmm. enough freedom, enough space, enough permission to put something on paper. But there's so many of our ancestors who didn't have the capacity to put anything on paper. And they didn't not live, they didn't not learn, they didn't not consider the cosmos, they didn't not do any of the things that we do. They just didn't have the capacity to write it down. Mm-hmm. And I think that in that way, it allows me to be like, I'm always. I'm never alone. Like even when I'm sitting by myself writing, I'm never alone. I'm always partnering with something, some energy, some teachers, some mentorship. And I don't think it takes anything from me. And that I think is what capitalism tricks us into thinking that if I acknowledge that I'm partnered with ancestral thought, or if I acknowledge that I'm inspired by another living writer, that in some way it makes me smaller. And I think in, in the truth, it makes me more connected. And Mm -hmm makes me less vulnerable and less isolated in the risk that I'm taking to think that thought, especially if it feels new to me. Like yeah. when I first started saying like, I'm an anti-capitalist, I'm a post-capitalist. Right. I was like, girl, you can't say that. Cause you don't know what the whole, what's the whole other answer. You, <laughs> right. you say you're a socialist, are you a socialist? And it's like, maybe I'm a socialist, I'm figuring that out. I don't like a lot of the social experience I've seen, but I know I'm not for capitalism. Mm-hmm. I know there's some other way that we're supposed to be. Um, you know, I, I want to talk with people who are thinking about cooperative economics and I want to write novels and novellas and short stories about alternative economic experiments. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I want to experiment with it, but I could take that risk because of years and years of people being communist and being socialist when it wasn't safe to do so and saying it's worth it. It's worth it to articulate and take the risk to envision and see and move towards something else because this is that soul sucking. It's worth it to move away from it. And I think that's true with a lot of the ideas. You know, I think so much of your writing is helping us say it's worth it to move away from shame. Even if we don't know where the fuck we're going. Right. Right. Even if we have to time travel all over the place to try to get there, (laughs) it is still worth it. Yes. Right. That doesn't mean we know what it means to be fully healed, which is one of the things I respect most about you is you're like, I'm not saying I got it together. No. I'm saying we should be honest about not having it together. <laughs> right. Like that distinction is so important to me. Yeah. It gives, gives so much space to all of us to breathe and to be like, mm-hmm. right. Um, I do think one of my things I hope is on my tombstone or part of my legacy is that people feel more permission to cite their partnerships and their collaborations yeah. and to name themselves like, what is the community that informs your ideas so that the ideas can live, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm like, the ideas I love the most are the oldest and sometimes the least named, Right. you know? Yes. I'm like, well, that one's good because it's oh, bigger than any one person. And I hope that the ideas that are coming through me are much larger than me, you know? Cause I like to sleep and smoke weed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not about to do that, like, I don't just do that. Like, yeah. I'm like, so I need I need it to be held by a lot of people because I'm. But how, how do you but look? Say, let me ask you this question. So as soon as, as you brought up the weed, I'm new to it. How do you do it and dream? Because when I do it out, I, I can't dream. Am I doing the wrong kind? No. Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, it also it depends on timing, right? Uh-huh. And it depends on amounts. So this is one of the things I figured out for me was the difference when I was in my 20s. I would get so high that I would pass out or I would get so high that I couldn't think or I couldn't function, right? And I was in a lot of pain, emotional pain that I didn't really understand. So it was like, I don't wanna feel anything right. and this will make me that gotcha. way. Now I'm like, I love feeling, right? Mm-hmm. And I have a lot of supports around feeling. Um, I have a lot of structures. I've done a lot of therapy, you know, like I'm like, feeling is great. So now, you know, I'll like puff before I go for my swim and just be like, 
oh. enhance this experience, right? Oh. I love to I love to smoke and work out. I love to like oh. puff puff, do my yoga, right? I'm like, I can yeah. literally bend deeper because of the ganj. Yeah. So that kind of thing. And then in the evenings, I tend to do more of like a light tincture or something. So again, I'm like, give me the, <laughs> the light tincture. The light tincture. I, I've started making my own tincture too, oh. because a lot of what's sold, just like we live in, in a sneaky country where it's like, you like this? I'll give you an overdose, right? Like yes. of everything. You like sugar? Everything. I'm going to give you 15 servings of this in one cookie, right? right. And I'm, I just started doing the sugar cleanse again. And I'm just like, these motherfuckers, I just looked at my vitamin over here. I was like, I'm doing vitamins. I'm so healthy. I was like, why are these vitamins made of sugar? It's candy. It's a vitamin candy, vitamin? right? Oh, okay. If you look at the added sugars on all these vitamins, it's like four or five grams. I'm like, 24 grams is what I'm supposed to have for the whole day. And y'all four of them are in my healthy ass thing. No, so, <laughs> the same thing has happened with the cannabis industry, right? Is it used to be like you're buying it on the street, you're smoking what you can roll, you have an experience. Now we're in the realm of edibles and all of a sudden the edibles are 360 milligrams. And I'm like, no human needs that. Is supposed right. to ingest that level. Right. So of course you can't dream, right? Your body's like, am I alive? Shame. Like, I really can't figure it out, right? Yeah. So that's one of the things I tell people is I'm like, actually take a little space, reduce your dosage, you know, like see if you can get, because that's the harm reduction. Your, right. your mind is so valuable and your dreams are valuable. And then I don't know if I dream that much in the early evening. <laughs> but I, I dream you. a lot in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And I am in a good practice. Um, Lucille Clifton wrote this beautiful set of poems that she was like, these were in partnership with slave ancestors. And in the this book called Soul Talk, she said, they I had to wake up early to hear them. And that has gotten really in my head that I'm like, mm. I don't want to ever smoke or drink or do anything so much that I can't be up at 5 30, 6 o'clock, because there's people who are waiting to tell me stuff. That's <laughs> and it. Yes. They like to say it in the dark. So yeah. 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 They like to say it in the dark. Um oh, oh I, I guess we went over time. Was it supposed to be over at 5 30? Uh I don't know. Oh, ER I want to get the, let me let me get this question in though because this is this is the question I wanted to end the joint on. Sorry, <laughs> I, I lost. Okay, Kara um, says we're good. So okay. um, I mean, you're fucking Casey Lehman. So no, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're the bestseller of Kara and, and the other that's one. You. So. That's you. I I literally you know? got the time messed up. But this is a really important question, and and I, okay. I think it'd be great to end on this if if possible. Okay. Um, Grievers teaches us that we need to learn to grieve. We need to remember we have souls in order to be in this time. This is from Janine. What else do we need art to teach us in this time? I hope Janine is still on here so she can. Mm. Yeah. Janine, my friend. Um, what else do we need art to teach us? Mm -hmm. There's a lot in that question in this time. I love that question. Yeah. I expect great questions from her. Um, hmm. Do you do you do you look to art for teaching? For teaching, I think I think so. I think it depends on the art, but there are things that I read that I'm like, I'm changed by this, and it taught me something new. So I recently finished The Prophets, and is amazing. Uh, it was incredible, and it taught me a lot about tenderness, tender, yeah. unexpected tenderness, and it humbled me that I, I had not really considered what love looked like, like same sex love looked like right. on the plantation. Yeah, um, It's not that I ever assumed it wasn't there, but it, I had never really sat with that. I'm like, there's never been a time when we weren't tender. Right. There's never been a time when we weren't vulnerable and we weren't falling in love with each other. So I think that art is supposed to be teaching us all the time how to feel more, how to yeah. be more aware of, the complexity of our feelings, that it's not like we feel one pure thing at a time, but it's right. actually always layered. Um, I feel like also, I think art is an invitation, like not even, you know, like I think the best teachers are the ones who are like, let me hold up a mirror to you and then invite you into the best self, right? right. Like this is where you are now and I can see a whole universe inside of you. Your possibilities are endless. And I feel like the kind of art I wanna create 
is art like that. You know, it's it's high bar. But when I think of the artists that I love, they made it feel compelling to become more myself. And mm -hmm. they made it feel compelling to feel more of my actual life. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it, you know, it's both about grief, but I think art is also supposed to help us get in touch with our mortality. Right. Um, and your work does that for me. Uh, you know, I feel like this idea that time is a construct and time is a cycle and time is nonlinear. And yet we have this very distinct sense of an arc of time in our lives. Um, I think it should make us take our lives I don't want to say more seriously, but more preciously, like to Ooh. spend, you know, to use our lives more preciously. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I was wasting time not creating. And it wasn't that I wasn't doing great work, but when the universe put me together, they put a creative spark in the heart right. of me. And it's a waste of my life to not attend to that spark. And I, yesterday I got to give a keynote to this coalition, Houston Coalition Against Hate, and I was thinking about how I think everyone has that creative spark in them and capitalism tricks us into getting jobs and becoming titles and thinking that something else is our calling. Right. And some of us are like, that's not my fucking calling. Like, yeah. you know, I'm, I, I have to go do this other thing. And I want to encourage people to do that. You know, I'm like Octavia Butler wrote, woke up at 3, 3.30 in the morning to write before she went to her factory job. And she wrote stories such that now, if, when you tell people Octavia Butler works in a factory, that is the bigger surprise. Right. And I want people to, I want that arc for more people where I'm like, <laughs> if I said to someone that you are a professor, they would laugh because they're like, he's right. a layman. Like, yeah. he's, he's the writer, right? right? Like, that's the essence. That's what his gift is. And um, I want people to be, I think also art is a constant saying, we all have the gift. Like, we all have it. I've never met anyone who, with a little nudge, didn't have that. And then I think capitalism is wasting all of our creativity. So I hope art makes people be like, fuck that. Ooh, man, we should fade the black, but I ain't got the controllers in my hand. Um, family, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. I mean, we I told you from the beginning, I wanted to talk about some of your past work, uh, some of what you've done to our insides and located in this book, because I Again, I feel like the residue of so much of what I've read before <laughs> is here. And if y'all don't have it, I just I wait. can't get over like sitting here with you for this whole time with you holding the book like that. It's just the cutest, best thing that could have ever happened in my life. I feel like when I when you, when you, when you, get, when you get books that feel right, you need to you need to let them know. Fam. So great. So, so thank so you, great. thank you for this art, and uh, thank yeah. you, thank you for loving us so deeply and so dearly, and 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 and. I don't want to say helping, but you do help me, fam. You don't really know me. So thank you for that, too. Thank you. Yeah, I love you very much. I and I think that you're a very, very important human being. And I'm so grateful that I know that this generosity is how you show up for writers. And I think it's one of my, it's like one of the best qualities about you. You're so generous, but it's really nice to feel it directly. It's good medicine and it'll make me keep writing more and more. So thank you. And thank you, Karis. I love y'all. Yeah. I want to talk about the ending, ER. Maybe you can have a, a, a group to come together and talk about what's next with this joint. Because I, I think I, I, I have some ideas, but I want to talk to other people about it. Yeah, I know. I'm like so. You're gonna have to text me now. I'm like, what do you want to know? Right. I, want to tell you I think maybe you can hold me. I need I need you to read the next one and tell me if it's working. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you both so much. This was um, this was good medicine for everybody on this call. So. Um, just so grateful to y'all. This is a beautiful way to to kick off the weekend. If folks have a weekend, uh, I hope you do. I hope you, whoever's watching, I hope you get to rest. I hope you get to curl up with this book, um, have have some peaceful time, and enjoy this art. Because I think, um, like Adrian just said, it will spark your creativity. It will make you, like Yacy said, want to go write. You know, every few pages. So, do that. Do that, even if you don't think you're a writer yet. Like that's the that's the best thing you can do right now. Um, Cause that is healing for all of us. Um, so you can click this teal button to buy Grievers from Karis. It really does help us when you buy event books directly from us, but you can also encourage your local library to carry it. Um, the Auburn Avenue Research Library in Atlanta is our library partner for this event. So they will be carrying it. 
um, and and spread the spread the love around. Make sure folks know about this book. If they if they don't live in a place that that has a bookstore, you know, send them the book. Let them know. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I think that's all. We'll we'll put this up on YouTube as well, so you can share that link with um, with captions and uh and spread the word that way but um thank you both so much it is always a gift to hear both of you it's a special gift to hear both of you in conversation um i hope you stay safe and well until next time thank you